good morning everyone welcome thank you for connecting uh, we will continue with our course on the study of the book of acts uh, we will also talk about uh, uh, the apostle paul and his life um, uh, as soon as he's introduced to this book uh, but for now we are learning about the birth of the early church so let's pray and uh, we will continue from where we have stopped uh, i'll just say a word of prayer Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're building us up, Lord, day by day. You're strengthening us. Lord, you're equipping us, Lord, in the things of your kingdom. Father, we ask for your grace. We ask for strength. Lord, we ask for your presence, Lord. Father, as uh, we continue to desire, uh, Lord, more uh, from who you are, Lord, and what you do. Even as we spend time, Lord, learning uh, about the book of Acts, we pray that uh, the supernatural grace, Lord, to move the way they moved, Lord, will be, uh, Lord, stirred up in us, Father God, and uh, that each of us, Lord, will do, uh, Lord, wonderful and mighty things for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So we were uh, in Acts chapter 2, and we saw how, uh, in the last class, how the disciples were asked to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When they waited, uh, there was a suddenly uh, occasion that came upon them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We saw how people from uh, many different parts of uh, the region, from far beyond uh, Jerusalem, had gathered in Jerusalem. And at that time, uh, when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in an unknown tongue. We also saw how this is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Though the, the manifestation of the walking of the Holy Spirit was different from what Joel had mentioned, uh, Peter was able to confirm that what was going on was through the work of the Holy Spirit. And then as people waited and they were wondering about what was going on, uh, Peter stood up, he spoke about the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. He gave an account uh, from their scriptures to prove to them that even the men whom they respect, like David, had spoken that God will not, uh, you know, let the body, okay, I'll, uh, refer, that body, he was not referring to his own body, but he was referring to the Lord Jesus. But when David wrote it, it sounded like, uh, you know, God will not let his body decay. But Peter points out beautifully that that was talking about the Lord Jesus, and indeed he has risen. So when the onlookers heard what was being spoken, uh, they were convicted by the Holy Spirit. If we all recall, you know, the Bible teaches us in John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit, you know, one of his roles is to convict. He brings conviction of uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the fact that people are far away from God and that they need to come back to God. And so uh, repentance, repentance has come upon these people and how beautifully um, you know, Luke writes, he, he explains their statements they say something like uh, what shall we do brethren what shall we do so they are asking about the next steps to come into the knowledge of the lord jesus to receive salvation and so peter lays it out clearly before them the action that they need to take which is repent and be baptized in the name of jesus christ for the remission of your sins and he also uh, talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit on that very first day uh, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice how he doesn't tell them that they have to wait and all that. But he just says, because the first time they needed to wait, but from then on, uh, you know, it, there is no such reference that people were asked to wait for the uh, uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. So that's why in continuation, he says, repent, be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And we saw how uh, this promise is for everyone who believes. It also includes us. And then we went on, talk a little bit about the way the church started to thrive. So we must understand that on one single day, you know, 
there were 3000 people who were added to the church 3000 souls were added so the church multiplied it exploded in one day uh, so we can imagine the responsibility that would have come upon the apostles and the disciples to take care of these new souls so the first and foremost thing for any leader spiritual leader is spiritual equipping so that's exactly the way in which they are leading the uh, new believers so we read in verse 42 here uh, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine so the teaching of the word was a very important part of the early church what else the breaking of bread so the breaking of bread in remembrance of what jesus has done uh, walking in the power of the cross that was very important to the early church and prayers so prayers uh, even from the time that you know the lord jesus ascended up into heaven we know that the people gathered and they always wanted to spend time praying uh, you know waiting upon the lord and uh, having that mind of oneness for the things that god had promised so these are the uh, the steps or these are the uh, activities of the early church okay uh, and before these activities begin uh, we see how the people had actually repented that is something they did from their hearts and another important thing that happened is that they were baptized they were water baptized and uh, we may think you know how did they water baptize uh, uh, 3000 people so our simple explanation is that water whatever water bodies were around uh, the leaders would have taken charge and they would have gone ahead and baptized so in one day baptizing 3000 people that would have been quite a task uh, but uh, remember how uh, in the morning is when the holy spirit was poured out upon them so you know uh, maybe they had the rest of the day you know, once people repented to actually go ahead and baptize 3000 people and luke writes um uh yeah on that day 3000 souls were added so it's likely that on the same day they were baptized now uh we've also looked at the ingredients of the early church that moving on verse 43 we see the impact of this believing community. It says, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So whatever was happening within the church, that was amazing. But at the same time, uh, the church started becoming that light that Jesus talked about, you know, he said, right, that I will build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So even at this point, this is the birth of the early church, but it is an impactful church. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So what's happening? Uh, uh, you know, the, the power of God is so real in their midst that they are carrying the power of God and, you know, they are... Uh, uh, experiencing the power of God. So when we notice the word fear here, it's not a negative kind of uh, fear, but it's more like awe. That would be the right word. To awe for the power of God, awe for the powerful works of God, or reverence is another word, reverence uh, for the work of God. So that building up that Jesus said, uh, I will build my church. They are being built up, and uh, you know the uh, the church is developing into that impactful church. And we'll see many things will come out of this impactful church uh, later on. But uh, right now, within the church, you know, that strength is being built, and uh, the miraculous uh, is very much a part of the early church so what do we read here many wonders and signs were done through the apostles so from this point you'll find that those 12 um, disciples of jesus uh, apostles is frequently the term that you are going to notice for those 12 men all the others uh, would be termed as believers or disciples or brethren uh, but then the apostles now have a distinct identity among the believers in the church because it's almost like 
you know, uh, they have to take up their position of uh, leadership and their function so that they can steer the congregation forward. So the apostles, there's a clear distinction. Now, uh, when we refer to these 12 people who were uh, selected by Jesus, what else was going on? In verse 44, it says, now all who believed were together, excuse me, and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So we spoke about the fact that there were visitors in Jerusalem. So when there were when people would visit Jerusalem, uh, it wouldn't be for very long durations, which is why they may not have brought everything, you know, from their homes. Uh, and now that uh, several visitors became believers and became a part of the church, they did not want to go back. So that is the situation. So we can imagine the scene. There are 3,000 people they're part of the church and they don't want to go back. And they have all their possessions back in their, you know, hometowns, home villages. So how do we care for the people? So it's a beautiful picture of a church. Uh, we study about this in the house of God. So we looked at the spiritual aspects, the spiritual nurture, which the leaders were providing. Uh, we are also now looking at the uh, natural sort of uh, care and nurture where there are physical needs that people have. So the church comes together. And uh, what do we read here? It says that they had all things in common, meaning there was a practice of sharing among the people. So those who had were willing to give to those who did not have. And at the same time, the generosity was to such an extent that people went out of their way to do what? Sell their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So it's really beautiful. We see the power of God filling the church, which is why signs, wonders and miracles took place. We also see the, the nature of God, the goodness of God filling the early church. So, you know, something like generosity is uh, very remarkable in the early church. Now, based on this scripture, sometimes people argue and they say, oh, the modern church, people are not like the early church. They even sold their possessions and goods uh, and, uh, you know, divided them among all. But we must look at it in its context. Why was there a need to do this? Because there were people with uh, uh, a definite need they couldn't go back to their homes. They wanted to stay on in Jerusalem. And this is the only way uh, that they could be provided for. So it depends on the need. So uh, we shouldn't really uh, you know, judge uh, those who don't do this all the time because it's not required all the time. There was a specific need. And in that context, people were generous. They were very, very generous. But when we study the scriptures in the, uh, the epistles written by uh, Apostle Paul, we notice there that he encourages every believer to be responsible. He encourages believers to work hard and provide for themselves and also to be able to give to others. So eventually, when things settled down, people were encouraged to take care of themselves, take care of their own family. So this is not uh, a reason for believers sometimes to you know, uh, condemn the churches or the leaders or uh, for, let's say, some believers to take advantage and say that in the early church, people even sold their positions and uh, goods. And so, you know, today we expect everyone to uh, give in this manner. Okay? So that's something for us to think about. Uh, so now, what else do we observe in the early church? Uh, we notice in verse 46 that they continue daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So this is a picture of fellowship. So far, we saw regarding spiritual nurture about you know natural care uh, member care is uh, 
what is the term used in many churches. So that also is part of the church. Now, the next aspect here uh, is the fact that they are fellowshipping. So they are fellowshipping. Where are they fellowshipping? We find that they continue daily with one accord in the temple. So in the temple, that was one place where uh, they would gather. Now, we know there were so many devout, they were uh, devout Jews. So that was already a practice that they had to regularly, every day, go to the temple. So they continued their belief in the Lord Jesus and you know their prayers even as they went to the temple. So that is something. Then house to house. So they would even meet in homes. So it really gives us a beautiful picture of a church. Today, we kind of follow similar patterns where we have Sunday services where people gather. It, it's almost like they went to the temple once a week or, or you know, here it says daily. Uh, and also house to house. So we have this concept of life groups or cell groups, uh, as some people call it, or care cells, where <coughs> the congregation can meet, they can fellowship, get to know one another. Uh, and what else did they do? There was also a breaking of bread from house to house. So they practiced communion, even at in their uh, you could call it uh, more like you know, sometimes we have this inhibition we feel like we can only have communion in the church and in a small fellowship would it be okay to have communion or not but if you look at what is being told here they did practice communion house to house and they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart so these are all very commendable things about the early church about how they uh, grew together uh, how spiritually, as well as in their love uh, and care for one another, they were being strengthened. Now, what else do we see here? We see that when the church was growing in this manner, uh, they had favor with all the people. Remember, I said the impact of the church. So the awe of God, the honor and reverence for God is within them, among them. And it's also coming upon the people around them. So verse 47 says, having favor with all the people. So the church is already emerging as an impactful church uh, uh, upon the community. So uh, these people, you know, they were, uh, uh, another point that I missed, there is praising God. We can put it as part of their uh, spiritual practice. You know, they were praising God. Along with fellowshipping, you can also put praising or worshipping. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we started with a number of 3,000, but daily there are a whole new bunch of people who are being added to the church. So it is beginning to be a thriving church. And uh, this is what, you know, every pastor wants daily numbers being added to the church but also when people come into the church there are all the other aspects we have to take care of their spiritual nurture and you know their care so it's not uh, so easy just to bring them in and then forget about uh, you know who they are so at this point let me just uh, stop and if there are things for us to talk about it would be really nice and then i'll go on to acts chapter two. Anything about a church or the way it functions or something that you liked about the features of the early church? What do you think about the early church? Yeah, so um, one thing that I liked about the early church, as you said, uh, they saw that specific need of the people. And uh, I don't think it happens in most of the churches right now. I don't want to say like, I mean, not really financially, but uh, I, I come from a CSI background. So I've seen how the services works there and uh, sad to know that even ministry became a job uh like the like a earning part uh so basically uh so i came from a csi background so 
what people usually do is so funny to hear uh, their perspective uh, so when people don't can't do anything so they obviously come to ministry and i was like that's not the reason why you come to ministry so when i came to ministry they had so many questions to me like uh, you are a topper at school you studied well why you do, want to do ministry so that's one of the thing i feel like uh, they don't really see the needs of the church even the emotional needs the we should really study the people uh, we are studying about urban church planting how church administration works and all these subjects what i really feel is we should really study the place what's the need of the place what is their lack and i think the early church did it very very good yeah because it's it's actually a major shift for them like from the law to righteousness it's like it's like a very big shift not everyone can understand it but they understood how we can make them understand and what are the things we need to do and i think uh, i should carry it in my heart for life like wherever i go and do my ministry i should really study the people know what is their need not because i feel like preaching this so i should preach this but what is their need what they need so that i can be a useful one yeah thank you chakina uh, quite insightful and such a reminder for us to remember that uh, uh, we we need to give our 100% when god people being added to the church is wonderful but you know are we willing to give our 100% to whoever that is and what their needs are yeah it's a real question that we need to ask ourselves as god's ministers so yeah thank you for that any other any other thoughts one thing that uh, strikes me is how the core of what they do is the spiritual nurture because it says continuing steadfastly so that word steadfastly is uh, it uh, points to a firmness in growing in the word of god like continuing steadfastly in the apostles doctrines and last class i shared that the apostles doctrines are um, what the jews believed in so you know the, the five books the torah and uh, also the teachings of jesus the kingdom of god and you know many other things that he taught so they held on tightly to it because one thing they knew is we have to pass it on that should never be erased or watered down but the core of what the church is is the doctrines and uh, that was the center now in addition to it we saw so many other things you know that they did and which really built the church so that that is something that i observed and it, it really uh, uh, helps me know what the church should be about so any other thoughts from your side all right so we we'll just uh, move ahead then let's go to acts chapter 3 another really important passage where we will see god at work and god at work through his people so uh let's go over what's happening here uh i would request someone to read please uh for for now we will read the passages and maybe as we go further i'll try to just summarize to uh, you know like uh, get some speed but it it's good as of now for us to just read through the account and then kind of i'll pres present the summary so acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 10 could someone read that Acts chapter three, verse one to ten. 
Now Peter and John went up together into the temples at the hours of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. So had him hands of them that enter into the temple, who sin Peter and John about to go into the temple at Acts and Ham. That's for and Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John with John said, Look on us, and he gave us heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and good have I not, but just I have if I give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Verse 8. And a leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and limping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Verse 10. And they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Brother. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Baker, for reading uh, this passage. So in this passage, what we see is that uh, Peter and John, we will begin to see that Luke will talk about a uh, few names. Okay, so it's not that the others are not doing anything, but it's just that uh, you know, somewhere uh, these could have been the key people who uh, were part of what was going on uh, in the church at that time. So uh, the focus goes to some names. So earlier it was just Peter. Now we see John. Peter and John went up together to the temple. So this, as I said, it was a normal practice at certain hours. Uh, in the Jewish custom, every devout Jew needed to go to the temple to pray. So even these people, now they're going to the temple. So uh, what's happening when they go for their usual prayer? We notice that there was a lame man. Uh, the explanation given here is that he was lame from his mother's womb, meaning he obviously never walked. His entire life and where was he seated so in those times they also had um, the people who were begging for arms sitting near the temple gates so that was sort of a, a, like people knew this is how it was and he sat there begging and since he is laid from his mother's womb uh, the assumption is that he was sitting at the gate for a really, really long time. Okay, he could have been there for many years, and uh, maybe Peter and John must have seen him earlier as well. So, what happens? This gate beautiful. What is the gate beautiful? Gate beautiful is a metallic sort of a gate to the temple, and it was termed or named as beautiful. That's why they're calling it the gate beautiful. So this man is sitting there asking for arms, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple. He must have done this to everyone who was going into the temple because his only expectation was to get something that uh, the people could offer. Now, scriptures also tell us that fixing his eyes on John, Peter said, look at us. So suddenly, you know, Peter wants to get the attention of the slave man. So he gives the attention. And Peter tells him, 
Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and move. So in that moment, what we can uh, say is that the Holy Spirit would have given Peter the discernment or the understanding that this was the moment for a miracle in the life of this man. Every now and then, yeah, every day they were going to the temple and at the gate beautiful this man would have been sitting but today something was different this was the time when god wanted to heal him and so peter discerning this in his spirit looks at this man fixing his eyes on him with john peter said is how you know, luke writes about this uh, and also let's just you know talk a little bit more what about the expectations of this man from Peter and John? You know, do you think he had faith to receive a miracle, or what do you think was his expectation? Doesn't look like he had faith or anything. He was only hoping for, you know, maybe some coins uh, as the others give him. So his expectation was very, very little or very low, and he didn't expect you know, anything at all. But at the same time, we notice that Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. Because he understood the expectation of the man. He only needs money. And he's telling him, I don't have. What the kind, the money that you're expecting, I don't have. But what I do have, that is so, so powerful as believers. To recognize that we carry the power of God in us. It's, you know, really important. And Peter knew that he carried the power of God. That's what he's saying. He's saying, look, what I do have, I give you. And not only that, uh, he has it, but what is he saying? It's meant to be released. What I do have. I give you the power of God. As believers today, wherever we go, and uh, discerning by the Holy Spirit, when we see a need, when we see a sickness, or when we see somebody oppressed, uh, just to ask ourselves the question, like Peter, are we in a place to recognize who we are, who we are in Christ, the power that we carry, uh, we use terms like uh, kingdom carriers, carriers of the presence, carriers of power. So do we really know that? And are we able to respond the way Peter responded and said, "I, what I do have, the power that I have, I give to you. Being able to minister, you see? So knowing what we have and ministering it is very valuable. That is something we learn from Peter in this particular incident. Now, there are commentators who say things like, uh, uh, at, the, uh, at that time, when the early church began, there was not much money. <laughs> That's what Peter is saying, you know, silver and gold I do not have, but I have power. I don't have money, I have power. But then some commentators say, today, uh, maybe some ministers or churches can claim the other way around we have money but where is the power you know so uh, that is something because we cannot do god's work without his power we may be equipped with resources uh, with everything we need to do church but the early church we yes we need all those things but they depended more on what they depended on the power of God. Even though they, they did not have money, they had the power. And that sort of is a good place to be in, isn't it? Uh, to carry the power of God. And today, hopefully, as the churches of today, we are able to say, yeah, we've been good stewards of the resources that God has given us. So we do have resources, but we also have the power. So whatever we have, you know, we, we give to you. Uh, and in this way, you know, Peter ministered to the slave man and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 
So he commands. How did he minister? He commanded in the name of Jesus. He said, rise up and walk. Now think together with me. This is Peter and John. They are probably nobodies to those who are coming to the temple. And uh, here's a lame man who has been lame since birth. How could they say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk? You know, uh, because it is risky. What if he doesn't rise up and walk? Isn't it? Uh, so, and you know, it, it was really a challenging thing to do. But we know that they carried, Peter carried faith in his heart. Okay? And it is because of that faith that he was able to make a command like this. And what, what is the power that he was invoking at this time? Like, of course, it's the power of God, uh, and we understand that. But more specifically here, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Those days, people had the same, many people had the same name. So he had to uh, boldly specify Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, with that authority, I am telling you, rise up and walk. He commanded so boldly. And he took up his, took him by the right hand and lifted him up. So what boldness. People are watching. What will happen if this man falls down? He's not worried about any of that. He commands. Then he supports. He lifts him up. Thank God for what continues after that, isn't it? It says, and immediately... So beautiful when we see words like suddenly, immediately. Uh, it's so encouraging that it happened right away. Immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. This is supernatural. A man who has never walked from his birth. You know, we can uh, discuss so many scientific things that his muscles would have atrophied, his joints, uh, you know, may, may not be all that flexible, flexible, maybe the bone strength is not sufficient. But immediately, what does the Bible say? His feet and ankle bones receive strength. So he leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them. Wow. That is a miracle that this man was able to uh, Rise up, jump. Luke, who's writing it, the doctor is writing this. Okay, so he's convinced that this is a miracle. Leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple. I wish I could show you uh, the scene in that movie that I talked about, Acts of the Apostles. Uh, you can go and, and see it because you know we can't uh, show you that movie here because of you know copyrights and all so we can't stream it in uh, this so anyway please do go back and uh, see that uh, scene and it sort of just comes alive that peter and john they speak to this man they uh, peter holds his hand raises him up and the man is actually jumping and leaping and it also says leaping and praising god so this must have been a uh a surprise to the people around because for so many years they have seen this man seated at the temple for the first time this man is walking around later on we will see in another uh, part where uh, it will give a timeline like 40 years old so for 40 years somebody who has not walked is walking and leaping and praising god that is a great miracle in verse 9 says that all the people saw him walking and praising God. Now, all these people would have known he has never walked. Okay? And they saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So, now a mighty miracle has taken place through the apostles okay, uh, in the temple. What do we expect? We expect that this should be the next step to the thriving of the church, 
to more people being added into the congregation. But let's see what actually happens. So could somebody go ahead and read for us from verse 11? Uh, you may read till verse 16, and then you know I'll, I'll go on to uh, the next section. Verse 11 to verse 16. Acts chapter 3, verse 11 to 16. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter saw this opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, ancestors who has brought glory to this servant jesus by doing this this is the same jesus whom you handed over and rejected before pilate despite pilate decision to release him you rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer you killed the author of life but god raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this fact through faith in the name of jesus this man was healed and you know how crippled he was before Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Yes, thank you, Jeffrey. So uh, Peter is looking at this as an opportunity to preach Christ. So there is a miracle that has taken place. It Usually what do miracles do? They get people's attention. And that's something that we talked about in the uh, Keys to Supernatural Ministry. And we know that Peter had the attention of the people. So he takes this as the moment to preach Christ to them. So he goes ahead and, you know, he uh, tells them that as people are looking in amazement, he tells them that, you know, you, why do you marvel? Uh, you know, and you're looking at it as if we have done this miracle. But you know what? It's not us. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus. So he's making a connect. And this can be very problematic for Peter simply because, you know, he's talking about all the patriarchs of the Old Testament and he's connecting them to Jesus Christ because he wants to prove that he is the Messiah. But that is what preaching is all about. It's about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the center of the message. So Peter takes the opportunity to give glory to Jesus rather than taking glory to himself. So that's another lesson he learned from those who minister uh, uh, here in the book of Acts. When miracles take place, they don't stake claim on it and try to promote themselves. It could have been so easy for Peter to say that, uh, yeah, you know, it's my greatness or something like that. But that's not what he did. Instead, he said, He's pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as he's explaining about the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he says, he talks a little bit about how the Jews did not accept him. In verse 14, he says, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted to you. So he is trying to preach and give a picture of who the Lord Jesus is. Now, the Jews would have known you know, the great I am uh, and, uh, you know, Jehovah God, the covenant God. And in relation to this God whom they knew, they understood his characteristics, things like he is holy, he is just. But now Peter is attributing it to the Lord Jesus. So he's saying, but you denied the holy one. Meaning, you've denied God. You've denied... Uh, you thought you're obeying God, but you've denied God. And then he goes on to say that Jesus is the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. So he's saying, you thought that you can actually kill who? the Prince of Life. 
you know how can that work because he is the prince of life and he says god raised from the dead so the lord jesus resurrected from the dead so this is painting the picture of jesus using terminology which they understood about you know the old testament god and he moves on and he uh, he's giving them the exact answer to what happened so in verse 16 he says and his name through faith in his name that's the answer how did this man become well through faith in the name of jesus so there's an apc publication that says uh, that talks about the mighty name of jesus what is so special about this name right here peter is saying through faith in his name has made this man strong right so in the name of jesus there are miracles and that is what peter has released and then you know uh, he says yes faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all so he's attributing the glory all the glory to the lord jesus whom he is equating as the god that the jews knew and also he's saying that there is power in the name of jesus and miracles take place that is how this man has been healed now let's uh, read from verse 17 to verse 26 i would request someone else to go ahead and read please verse 17 yet yeah. now brethren i know that you did it in ignorance as did also your rulers but those things which god foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the christ would suffer he has thus fulfilled repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the lord and that he may send jesus christ who has preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which god has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began for moses for moses truly said to the fathers the lord your god will raise you will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people yes and all the prophets from samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which god made with your with our fathers saying to abraham that in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed to you first god having raised up his servant jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities yes, yes. thank Amen. you so uh, in short he is calling the people to repentance and respond to the message so that again is a beautiful thing that we note uh, one is he is speaking about jesus and then he is asking for a response so what we'll do is we will uh, stop at this point we'll come back after the break and then i'll go ahead and explain the passage we just read so uh, thank you everyone uh, let's come back and also let's be prepared to read so that we can go faster okay so thank you see you in 10 minutes <laughs> 